Hey, welcome back. Uh, sorry it took me a little extra time to uh, get this lecture up. I was out of town all of uh, last week, so I'm still still getting a little caught up. Anyway, uh, what we're going to talk about is really mostly springs. Springs can store energy, commonly used that way. Good way to look at potential energy, and it also links to elastic plastic properties of solids that we talked about last time so uh, I, th I think this can actually be a, again a very good integrator for lots of stuff in your lectures or in your in your courses um, so let's get into it um, for, first what I want to do is back up and uh, talk about some of the things actually I'm very pleased with the way things are going so far it, people are interacting through the boards I'm looking forward to seeing you Next COSI session, talking through some of these things. Um, let's see, change to Windows Basic and let that do its thing. And this computer is not bad, but far from good. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to kind of tell you that there are some great ideas bubbling up in various ways from, from you all. And I do want to capture them. So we, we talked in uh, the kind of the first real lecture about things you could pace through history and uh, see how things have changed over the years. And uh, lots of good examples came up. Uh, one big category was sporting goods, and uh, there's a lot of these that, that can really be made into very rich examples. Helmets, and I've seen this done, um, you know, going back from the old days of football to leather helmets. Um, you, know, you look at hockey and sporting goods there, and, you know, the people used to be stitched up and sent right back out of the ice. Uh, but uh, helmets have lots of great technology that are materials enabled. Tennis rackets are the same thing. I don't know as much about that. Uh, we're going to talk about this example, the vaulting pole for pole vaults later on. That's a big deal. Um, it has something, actually all three of these have something very much in common. That is that they do store elastic energy and that's a big part of what makes them good. And We'll talk about that. Uh, clothing is another great example I haven't really thought about before, uh, but uh, you know, again, going we've always needed clothing as long as we were semi-civilized species, and it goes back to animal pelts, uh, to uh, you know, uh, polyester being a great invention of the of the 60s and 70s to uh, today's fibers and all that. Shoes have gone through a similar trajectory. Now, cars are relatively recent in the whole whole series of history, but that's that's one you could talk about. Uh, buildings and houses are a great one. Um, I live in a house that's about a hundred years old now, and uh, boy, it isn't the way you'd make it today. And if you'd go a hundred years before that, um, actually, it wouldn't be as different from uh, the way it's built now. But um, it's really evolved. Televisions haven't been along that ground along personal electronics either, uh, but those are are good things. The roadways have really improved. Um, you can do things with bullets, armor, and glass. Um, actually, our, our armor, you know, and this is one I'm not sure you, uh, could, could be interesting for students. I'm not sure how much you want to talk about military technology. Um, you could get in some interesting experiments, but armors and bulletproof glass and all that, there's some really fascinating stuff out there if you uh, go through YouTube. There's some fascinating stuff looking at bullets penetrating various things. Uh, lots of great material stuff in healthcare, um, eyeglasses, artificial limbs, wound care, uh, hairbrushes, plows, uh, washing machines, dryers, those are good ones. And another class was brought up of, of materials uh, is really what goes on with sustainability, how we transmit electricity from place to place, how we recycle. Um, last week I heard a fascinating talk about uh, the upcoming trend. We've always had mining and that's one of the ways we you know get what we need we get metal ores out of the ground and it's really interesting what's happened the past several years is that the ores we get out of the ground we've taken all the really good stuff and we use lower and lower grade ores and right now richer deposits of things like copper and other things are actually in our junkyards in our um in our uh places we dispose of stuff and there's actually a lot of effort now going on on how do you reclaim uh, the good stuff out of junkyards and uh, this is something that is becoming becoming called urban mining and I think that's a good good name for that basically taking junkyards and getting the good stuff out of that 
uh, sustainable materials, mining, recycling, are actually becoming more and more like one also. Um, also from before, we did some calculations. Most people got this, uh, but uh, there were a few people struggled with it. Um, so we talked about uh, the calculation of strength, and I said you have a wire that's ten thousandths of an inch diameter, fairly fine wire. I told you what this is in millimeters as well. And uh, say it's four feet long. And so really the, 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 the calculation of this is the stress is equal to force divided by area. If you do this in English units, the force is five pounds, I think I said. Yeah, five pound load. And then the area is pi radius squared. And R in this case, and then R in this case would just be uh, 0.00, oh, sorry, 0 0.01 divided by 2, or 0 0.05. And when you work that, turn the crank, you get a number of about um, 63,000 pounds. Per, per square inch. That's the number there. Uh, and if you do this uh, in metric units, you get a number of about, um, I think that one is, that example I pulled is actually off a little bit. I think that comes to uh, about 448 megapascals. And I happen to know that the conversion from megapascals to uh, thousands of pounds per square inches multiplied by 145, 448 times 145 equals, that's about right, about 63,000 pounds. Um, so th th this is uh, about the right, the right answer. And then when you take this, so that's, the, so, so the idea here is this is the force, the area you're talking about is that area there where this would be the diameter and then the radius is half the diameter. And then the strain to failure is just change in length divided by initial length, and you get about 10% strain to failure. And those are typical numbers for what you'd see for something like a wire, and that's a fairly high strength wire. And again, uh, with things like five pounds and all that, this is stuff you can absolutely do within your classroom and break stuff and break high strength materials and, and develop whole stress strain curves. And uh, I tell you, I, I find the discussion that has emerged from this absolutely fascinating on what students can and can't do, what they'll appeal to and, and, and what won't appeal to them. Um, but um, boy, to me, the important part is, is, is making the point that science is a predictive thing. If you know how to do science, you can design things, you can predict things, and it is a power um, that um, can earn your livelihood and all of that, and that's a, an important message uh, to get out there. So um, again, just uh, again, kind of taking from the comments, um, you know, from before we did tensile testing, and then stress is basically just force divided by force divided by area. So if you've got something long and slender like that. It's this force going that direction divided by that area, and we often call that by the Roman sigma, symbol sigma. I wouldn't necessarily do that with your your students. Strain is just basically the like a percent elongation, and so just the change in length divided by some initial length. A strength is basically a stress at failure, and then a ductility is basically a strain, strain at failure. So we say something is ductile if it can stretch a long way before it breaks, and status. I have no idea what I, what what that means there. Oh, oh, I do know what I meant by that. Um, status. Um, so I wanted to say also. Um, status of this is, is Andy Nightum has uh, been working with one of my students, Katrina Booz, um, and they're actually helping to, to refine a tensile test lab, 
If any of you want to use this in your classroom, again, I can supply some students, a student to you probably, and we are refining some of the procedures to make this a little better. So if anybody wants to use this, I would love to help out and also document what works and what doesn't work and make this a little bit better. And that's what we mean by, that's what I put there to status to remind myself. Um, okay, so, so now what I want to do is, is learning objectives for this spring lecture. Um, and here's what we're going to do in this thing. First of all, we're going to learn how to make a spring, which is a fairly different thing, a fairly easy thing to do. Secondly, what we're going to do is talk about the elastic stiffness of the spring. This is related to and similar to the elastic stiffness of materials, the elastic modulus we talked about. And then um, and, and strength are applied to a, a simple article. So we're going to make these springs and see that they have a stiffness, they have a strength themselves. And that can be related to the material and the shape. And then we can make this simple article. So we take a material, a wire, and then make a simple article, which is a spring, and characterize the strength and stiffness of that. Um, this is another great thing where we can do some wonderful graphing, learn about slopes. The slope is called the spring constant. It's basically how stiff the spring is. I think there's a way you can kind of make uh, slopes come to life a little bit. And this might be a little advanced, but a spring is a thing that stores potential energy. We can measure that potential energy a few ways, and we can actually see that do work and make little catapults this way. And uh, Andy Nightem is going to talk through something like this in COSI visit number three. And this'll, this is some, some of the basis that goes into that. So we're going to develop this idea and hope some of you will end up using this. So again, um, th this fits nicely, we think, I think, in the physical science timeline. This gets into motion and force. Um, energy transformation is going from kinetic energy, um, really for potential energy or force times distance, to potential energy stored in a spring. We can use that to fling things, make that uh, turn that into kinetic energy. So energy in motion is in there. Forms of energy can be in there. Um, we will link this to atomic bonding and how bonds are stretching, so it really starts getting into um, some of these aspects as well, and uh, chemical bonds and reactions in particular. So this really, again, hits many of the topics that are core for ninth grade physical science. So again, and th this is some of the uh, slides. I'm going to go through these more slowly. The last lecture, I, th I think uh, consensus is there was a reasonable job done at the beginning, and then at the end I uh, flipped into turbo speed and, um, and, and went a little too fast. So th this is what goes on uh, with elastic deformation. We take a wire, we put a force on it, and when things are elastic, what you're really doing is you're changing these bond spacings, and with x-ray diffraction we can actually measure these things. We can see that, that the bonds are getting longer this way, and they're not changing much this way, and they might even be getting a little bit smaller going that way. Bonds don't like to do that. They have an equilibrium length associated with them. And when we put this force on it, that causes them to stretch. This stretching of these bonds, this non-equilibrium state, is what really elastic deformation is about. And that's why if we remove it, whoop, they go right back to their original states. So the bonds stretch, and then they recover when the stress is removed. Metals and ceramics, you can only get very small strains. Um, and you're on the order of you know, really less, you know, typically less than 1%. One, less than 1% elastic strain is what we get in metals and ceramics. We can also do the same thing with a rubber band. Rubber bands, it's not quite the same thing that happens. It's not quite the same bond stretching. I don't think it's a topic we want to get into. It's different. And with elastomers, things like rubber bands, you have nonlinear elastic deformation. You get a force displacement curve that has some nonlinearity into it. And with something like a rubber band, you can go out here to, uh, you know, 
changing the the length by almost 10 times so it's completely different than what you see in metals and ceramics and that's something we could talk about but i think that gets pretty deep pretty fast what happens when you put too much force on it is these planes start to shear past one another and then you go from this linear elastic part on a force displacement curve over to where you see this thing and very often what you see are things that plateau very dramatically you go from linear elastic like this all of a sudden wonk goes right over and then when you unload you get the elastic strain back but you don't get the plastic strain back and that's what you see when you take that wire and you stretch it it gets longer you remove the load it gets a little bit shorter but only just a little bit so plastic means permanent and it's because these bonds or the, these these atoms are changing neighbor neighbors and doing so in a permanent way through what we call shear which means these planes are shearing past one another okay and for the elastic part um, it, it, this is probably a little bit too advanced a concept, but I do want to make the point that this does goes right back to the basic chemistry, whereas if you've got two bonds, you've got two atoms, and you could imagine this is something like table salt, sodium, you know, positively charged, chloride negatively charged. They attract, they get as close as they can, and you know, these would be kind of the center to center distances. This is what we call you know, kind of this R naught here. And if we that that's the equilibrium distance that so they get to any closer than that their their nuclei start to get in the way of one another. But if you try to pull them apart, the potential energy goes from this lowest state upwards and it turns out it's really the curvature at the bottom of this potential well here here that sets the elastic modulus. The sharper that curvature the higher the elastic modulus is and basically the stronger the bonding is so I don't want to make a big deal out of this except to say that these elastic properties are very much related to the chemistry and the bond energies and we can do a really good job of uh, understanding that fundamentally so again so this is kind of putting it all together permanent plastic deformation this is kind of redundant from what we did before you start loading things up it's initially elastic comes over bends over, if you remove the load, you get the elastic strain back, the, the, this stretching between the bonds recovers, but the strain developed by changing neighbors and shearing does not. And that's um, you know, the basics of elastic and plastic deformation. What we're going to show in this lecture is, you know, last time we showed we can do that in a wire and get really fundamental material properties. Here what we're going to do is show we could also do that in a spring and get some um, more applied uh, properties applied use of that so again this is elastic strain and recovery just another image of exactly the same thing this slope is something we call the elastic modulus bends over this is a yield strength this is, this is a material property this is another material property the way this might harden that's another material property and as engineers we choose materials to get the properties that we want so you know, Steel, automobiles aren't made primarily out of steel by accident. Steel has very good properties for making an automobile. Um, aluminum does too, but aluminum has one property that's a lot worse, and that's that it's about three times as expensive on a per pound basis. That's one of the reasons we tend to make cars out of steel so much. We can save a little weight by aluminum, and uh, indeed we actually see more and more aluminum going into cars. So this is a yield strength. This is the stress at which noticeable plastic deformation has occurred. Again, it starts to bend over. And then after it bends over, you can see that the material will sometimes harden. This is hardening, and you see that the, the, the force over area, which is equal to the stress, this axis increases as we put more strain. This is delta L over L into the material so you get some hardening and that's basically because there's this deformation uh, geometry that happens and these slip traces tend to get in the way of one another and it makes it harder and harder for the material to keep um, to keep deforming very interesting stuff this is what I um, spent <laughs> spent more than a little bit of time thinking about and a lot of my other geeky friends too do as well 
Um, yeah, it's amazing. There's jobs there, but but yep, there are. Um, okay, so um, let let's apply all this stuff with a spring. Let's think about this with with in the context of a spring. Last time, I told you we can go out and go to McMaster.com. And we can buy wires of various diameters, various materials, and and let's consider, for example, uh, three wires. I'm gonna I'm gonna talk through at least in a thought experiment three wires of the same diameter and um, I've purchased about ten thousandths inch diameter ten thousandths of an inch point zero one inch diameter I bought um, hard stainless steel annealed or soft stainless steel so this is stuff that's chemically the same but by straining it we can either make it hard or soft or by heat treating it, we can make it hard or soft and I've also got a third material aluminum so hard stainless soft stainless and then thirdly is aluminum um, so the the tasks we're gonna do here is first try to make springs of the same size and shape and same size and shape would really be good if you can do it and we'll see that this is actually kinda difficult but I think this could actually make a really nice little artsy craftsy project for your um, for your class. Not easy, but possible. And one of the things that this I think kind of can make the point of also is if you are going to get into science or technology, having good techniques matters. And if you can learn to make these springs consistently and get the same size and shape out of different materials, that's actually uh, something that, that the kids could and should feel proud of, I would like to think. Then what we're going to do is measure these force deflection curves, see if things recover. And if they don't recover, that's a measure of how strong the, str the spring might be. And we can also make these force deflection curves as a function of different ge geometries. And then we've got a great graphing exercise where we can look at slopes, peak forces, um, does it recover or not. And then as an advanced topic, the area under the elastic part is the stored potential energy. And it's a bit of a big concept, but I think for the, some of your better students, we can get that. And you can use that stored potential energy for many catapults, and you can see which ones give the most oomph. And we can also see where the energy comes and goes. And uh, you, know, you should see that it's related to the area under the curve. Okay, So there's a lot we can do with this really simple stuff. And what I like about this myself is these are things you can buy. You can teach kids that you can actually fabricate things that they wouldn't think they can make, things like springs. And you can do it in a completely transparent way. And this is really what engineering is. This is, uh, is, is how, how do you make something useful from the stuff that's around. And that's the essence. And spring is a very simple uh, example of that. Very useful device, but uh, you can actually make it. So let, let's uh, consider making some springs. First of all, what defines a spring? And I contend, and, and we're just going to stick at this point with coil springs. We'll talk about others in a little bit. So a coil spring, basically you've got this and the wire does that and then might come down like that. That's a coil spring. So what defines the coil spring? Okay, well, it's the material you use, it's wire diameter, So right now I can say we're using ten thousandths of an inch diameter material. I said we have hard, hard stainless, soft stainless. Um, the other thing I can do is I could imagine that the length of the spring section matters. I can call that length L. That's going to matter. Um, I could imagine that the, the density of this matters. You're going to have a, a different spring I've got something like that, or something like over the same area, I've just got three loops. So you can call uh, the number of turns per inch or per length is something that should be important. And the last thing that's probably very important 
is this diameter of this of the spring and I contend that if you can define all these things and keep them about the same you, you, you've got you know a, a spring that should be fairly predictable and what I'd like to, to be able to do I think would be great is if you could take something and use the same use the same wire diameter the same length same number of turns per inch same coil diameter and do this say for example with soft and hard stainless steel and um, and aluminum you can also with copper and other things anything you can go to McMaster car to buy or you can also change you know wire diameter length and all these things and with this you can you know do some nice studies on well how does length matter how does turns per inch matter how does diameter matter and see how the characteristics of the spring change how does the material matter and that's really I think Thing that's most interesting to me and if you're going to change materials they should be geometrically similar and technique for making these things is really important um, if you and, and you don't necessarily need to use all three materials but if you do for example compare soft versus hard stainless steel what you're going to find is the soft stuff coils very very easily but the hard stuff if you take it along something that's too big of a diameter it's just going to spring back it's not going to take that set it's going to be difficult to to do that so there's some interesting technique that needs to be put into this um, this is from Andy Nightum this shows a technique that you can use for making good springs and all you see this is just a pencil this is a variable speed drill you can basically put the, the wire into the into the chuck oh, I'm sorry just gonna use a lighter color here you can basically take the wire and and load it in with the pencil into the chuck and then start slowly winding it and what you can do is also put some tension on that wire and that will actually help you make a spring of the same diameter it's actually fairly difficult thing to make a, a spring of the same diameter and by it diameter again I'm talking you know this this diameter this spring here it's difficult to make them the same you can do it with the same um, with, with hard materials and soft materials and one thing that actually helps a lot is if you can keep a fairly large and consistent force on this is your is your turning it so this is the whatever you're doing this around if you put a large force on it you want to do something other than a pencil but if you keep a force that's near the yield strength you'll get something that's that's uh, gonna stick to that geometry the other thing you could do is you could come on here and put marks on here and try to get the same density of turns and this one they're making something that's, that's a, a very dense spring but you could make it so that you try to get it so that you're getting one turn or you know, ten turns per inch or five turns per inch and again there's some interesting technique and you could um, you know complement the students on their manual technique and help them develop some manual technique just by trying to make some of these springs and try to match diameter and length with different materials and I think that would be uh, useful exercise in itself so now what can you do to measure their characteristics well if you've got a spring there's two easy ways of, of measuring uh, characteristics you can do them in tension or in compression and their um, spring constant that we'll get to in a minute or define that in a minute uh, should be the same either way it shouldn't really matter whether you're doing it in tension or compression so the most common thing we do with a spring is do something like this hang a mass from it and then we can use a ruler to measure that that deflection like that or what we could do is do the same thing in, in compression where you could take take basically a board let's start again take a board Cut a hole in it, have the spring sitting above this hole. Put something across the top like this, 
and then have the mass hanging down here. And again, you can have a ruler that looks that looks like that. And so what you're going to find is if you do this relatively carefully, so what you have is you're going to vary the force, and um, and then you can measure the change in length like this. And what you should do is if you, you know, imagine um, you know, this was your zero point here, you should be able to see go force like this. Initially it's going to be linear, but once the spring uh, starts to set permanently it's going to do much like you saw with a piece of metal on its own. It's going to bend over and go like that. And then if you re remove that load it will still suck back but not completely like that. So you can get to find that there's, there's a couple things going on here that are interesting. One is this thing called the spring constant, which is just the slope of that thing. And then the other is, um, if we have force down here, the other would basically be the failure load here, where it starts to become nonlinear again. Okay, so that's something that we can um, that we can get. So. Um, so really, again, an interesting thing you can do is, again, we said the spring is defined by material. Uh, the, the, the big diameter, turns per inch, the length. And I think it's all these things are great things that you could study. And what you should find is that as the spring gets longer, so you just have more turns, and everything else is the same. The spring should become more compliant. Um, if you use larger gauge wire, the string, spring is going to become stiffer. Um, it turns out that if you take two types of stainless steel and again um, put force on this side, imagine that we're going to do displacement here. If you have two types of stainless steel, what you should find is, let me do three materials on here. Let's imagine this is my soft stainless steel. You should see something like that. If I do a hard stainless steel, Color. Uh, you should actually get something like this where the diameter is the same. The, the, the slope shouldn't be any different, but what you're going to get is the force that causes failure to happen should be much, much higher. So it should have the same spring constant. So this would be hard. And then if you're going to do aluminum, uh, and everything is going to be the same, Aluminum, it turns out, has about one-third the elastic modulus of stainless steel. So if you keep all these geometry constants the same, for aluminum you should see about a third of the slope. And it may also have a fairly small failure load. So you get something like that and like that. So you'd have different spring constants depending on the, on the elastic properties of the material and different failure loads depending on the strength of the material. And then the geometry plays in, so there's a lot, a lot of stuff that you can do with respect to graphing and understanding things just with, um, ju just by the, the, these simple springs. So again, um, graphing exercises, slope, spring constant, you know, failure force, uh, you can do areas under the curve. And uh, what I would really uh, uh, like is when we discuss this, what, what you think is accessible to your students and what isn't. So you can choose either axis you like. Um, I, I like to put force up here and displacement here. And uh, so you should be able to get curves that look like that. Like that, and then when you unload, they should be a little more, a little more like this, also. So when you put real data on that, you can get something like that. The potential energy that's stored is at this under the elastic part, which is really this. I'm not 
sure that that's something that's going to be too important to you or something that's going to be too accessible. Um, this is sort of the failure force. So there's a lot you can do with, with really simple graphing exercises that come from really nice legitimate data with this. So um, th th this is uh, um, it's taken from Andy, but this is uh, the spring constant. It is k. Force is equal to k times x. Sometimes you put a minus sign on it, depending on what your your force convention is. Um, F is the restoring force, usually newtons. K is a constant, which is the spring rate which is newtons per meter of deflection. And then x is the deflection. And so it's basically just, again, just this slope here is a spring constant, that rise over that run, f over x. So delta L would be, that would be x, OK? So again, take that, convert it. K is equal delta F over delta X. Okay. Again, ask questions on the discussion boards if anything isn't there. So again, I kind of covered this already. Big point. You do it this way. This is delta L. This is force. Data should look something about like that, and then if you unload it's like that, and this is really the strength, this should be pretty linear. You will get good data if you're modestly careful with this, it's easy enough. And what's nice is if you make your own springs, you can change all the spring spring uh, elements as you, as you like. So geometry effects, we've talked about effect of D, effect of L, effect number of turns, effect of length, all of that. Materials effects, the, the big ones are the spring constant should be proportional to the stiffness of the material uh, if the geometry is constant. Proportional to the Young's modulus, which is E. So, for example, um, if we've got um, aluminum versus stainless steel, aluminum has about a third of the stiffness of stainless steel. If you can keep the geometries the same, you should see about a third of the stiffness out of the aluminum spring than the stainless steel spring. Um, strength of the spring should about scale with the strength of the material. So again, if you can make them geometrically the same, which is a trick, um, you should be able to find that, again, two things to find this. This is force, this is distance, this is your spring constant, this is your failure force. And um, those are re related to the materials and are also related to the geometry. So easy things to study, I would hope. Okay, so the next thing you can do is there's a number of ways you can make a little slider for this, and and, and a bunch of ways you can do this. The way I'd like to, to to do this, and Andy's got a little bit different way of doing this. So they're they're not that different, but what you could do is take the edge of a table, like this. Pretend that's the edge of a table, and I'm going to take a quarter and hang that quarter off, just so. It's hanging off the table. Just let me redraw it a little bit, just so it's the center piece of this is just on there, so the, the quarter just barely stable there. And what you can do is take your spring, compress it a little bit, and then let go, and then see how far you can make the quarter slide. And what you're doing is you're storing work. The work that you store. Work is basically the integral of force 
over distance or basically force multiplied by distance. So if you've got force versus distance, you know, this is basically the work stored. That's energy. So work in this case would be one half force times distance or the area or F max. So this would be force max there. And that's the work stored. That's all potential energy that you can plunk back out. So um, I can take a spring and I want a spring that I can kind of make in compression and I know that what my spring should do is my force should change with my spring compression this so so anyway the, the amount of distance I can put in here dx or the delta x that I can use to push the quarter it's only about half a quarter long and so if I have a spring so it's just barely compressed imagine my 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 length of the spring that's free is is like that and I'm just taking it so I only compress it just by that this amount delta x prime I'm gonna give it and it's gonna go some distance not very far okay so now if I were to take this thing but and pre-compress it first so that's down like this and get the same delta x the force here um, when, when we've got no compression on it the force is small this is force and compression the force is small so this would be the energy I'd be storing down here if I've taken it and compressed it to this length here compressed it to here this is the amount of energy that I'd be storing so if I take it pre-compress it and then fling it this thing is going to go much 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 farther so this is the potential energy that I've expended because if I took it to here and let it just let it go to there, it would still have more potential energy that could go out to there. And I may have to do this demo on a little YouTube or something. I'm not sure this is becoming entirely clear. Let me know. Um, and then what happens is this quarter skids along and it dissipates work. And the work that it dissipates as it goes along is there's a frictional force here and the force of friction force of friction is equal to the coefficient of friction times the mass of the penny or the quarter that gives a, a, a basically retarding force that, that acts in the other direction that's consistent as it goes and so the work done on the other side is basically work done it's basically just F times delta X, and that's the work, work done. So the point is that the distance the penny slides should be proportional to that energy that's in that area under that curve. And as an advanced thing, you could show that. From what I hear, I, I think not, not going to be too many people getting there, but point I want to make is this can all be traced to back to, to, to really um, you know it's really kind of like freshman in college physics and this actually wouldn't make a, a very bad uh, freshman physics lab I think so Andy Knighton will talk this through but, but the important and he's going to do this something in cosine and the, the important part is the energy in is basically the inner area under this this curve over some some part and then the energy out is basically um, the force of sliding multiplied by the distance. And you could, for example, start your pennies here, and there's a number of ways of catapulting them, either with coil springs or cantilever springs, and you can fling them. And again, the, the distance that they go should be about related to the energy that you've Put into it over here. If anybody wants to develop that, talk to me, um, and I'll help you uh, develop it. I'm not right now. I just want to gauge: is this something that's uh, doable or not? 
Okay, so, so we've made coil springs, or you, you know how to make a coil spring. There's other kinds of springs we can make very easily. Um, diving board, we've got something like that. Put, you imagine this is held fixed, and you push this down. That's a cantilever spring. Again, if you the force here should be about proportional to the distance, and if you push it back here, it's going to be much stiffer than out there. Leaf springs we use in cars all the time mount them onto the chassis, those two points, put the axle there and allow that to move up and down. It allows your car to bounce. Um, you could take a wire and just do what we did before, of just basically have it hang like that, but that's going to be way too stiff. Actually, it's way, way stiffer than if you took that same wire and did that to it, and you can't get very much deflection, so you actually can't store very much energy out of this, but you can store a lot of energy out of that coil spring. The other thing you can do is even do things torsionally. You can take a bar like that, connect it on one side, and then take it and, and put it in torsion, and torsion springs are also used sometimes. And these are used for a bunch of things. Among the things they're used for, um, biggest thing is, is actually measuring force. Springs are the big way we measure force. This is sort of a fish scale. Um, the other way we often do this is take uh, a, a bar like this. If you have a bathroom scale, we put a couple cuts in it. Like uh, cuts are a little more severe usually than this. And then we have some little electrical gauges that can measure strains. We put these gauges on on a region like this. A couple wires come off, and then you can measure force that way. It's basically a spring, but a much more compact one, much stiffer spring. And uh, basically, it's this elastic deflection. Same thing in a spring we use in bathroom scales, and it's almost always the way we, we measure force. Uh, car suspensions we've talked about, energy storage we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, you know, basically, for, for doing a latch or maintaining a force is another reason we use springs all the time. So they're very, very, very common devices, um, not given nearly their due in um, things like ninth grade science. And again, you can, you can build them yourself. So again, this is the biggest one, and again, this kind of makes the point we were talking about before. Um, if you've just basically got uh, a spring, something you can, a load pan, you can put some load on, and a measuring stick, you can go forward, and uh, this Andy Knight uh, found here, passed it on to me. So again, nothing, nothing is new, we're just showing this up. But put one little bit of force on there, so basically you've taken this guy, put it onto the load pan, Bang, you know, got some force. You can measure the force. You can measure displacement. And in this case, the force is one unit. I can do force. Force is equal to two units. And you're getting some displacement there. Force is equal to three units. Force is equal to four units. Again, it's a good graphing exercise. And again, if you kept going further, at some point you'd find that the spring just started stretching out something like that, maybe not going quite straight over, but it would do something like that. And when you came back down, the spring would not come back. So put too much weight on a spring, you break it. We can measure that breaking force. Hopefully we uh, covered that already. So where else do you use this? Um, Andrew Heckler gave me this example, um, which is a great one. Um, back in the old days, um, Pole vaulting is, is one of these sports things that's really evolved over the years, and elastic energy is a big deal in it. Um, we had different pole vaulting eras. The first era was wood. This is what it looked like when you were pole vaulting with wood poles. Um, pretty impressive, still a pretty good athletic thing, but not at all like the way we do pole vaulting today. Today we store a lot of electric en elastic energy in that pole. Uh, so we went from wood, we got a little more flex with bamboo, did better with fiberglass composites. Today we can do something that's lighter, stores more energy, is stronger with carbon fiber composites. And um, so that's gone from vaulting back in these days to um, you know, more what it looks like today. And you can imagine when you're taking something like that and bending it like that, you go from something that's straight to something that's, that's bent like that, just look at the simple geometry. This arc 
is going to be longer than that arc. This region out here is in tension. This region in here is in compression. And uh, this material would really, really like to break in half, but the stuff is really strong, therefore it doesn't. But the really important thing is this is storing a whole lot of elastic energy, and that's what helps get people much higher in pole vaulting than they were able, ever able to before. Um, and uh, this is a wonderful YouTube link that goes through the history of pole vaulting very quickly, shows how that uh, different materials enabled different types of vaults. So um, that, that, that's all I want to cover today. Um, look forward to your comments, and, and we're going to expand on some of this when we meet in COSI. So what did we learn? First of all, that materials properties are really important in device performance. Hopefully you see that the strong materials make good springs, the weak materials don't, but it's hard to make stuff out of the strong springs. Um, that's what's said there. There's lots of ways you can do this for great graphing, and then hopefully you can connect all of this to what happens in physical reality and that's what we are hoping to do is give you some really good authentic examples you can implement in your class and do these very cheaply and if you need any materials I mentioned before I've got I've spent a couple hundred dollars and I've got miles of wire that I'm happy to share um, questions for you you see the quiz and discussion boards um, basically this quiz is going to be a lot like what we had last week I'm going to ask you to uh, Give your comments and start a discussion, and um, and please connect with me directly if you'd like to have access to students or stuff. Um, look forward to uh, all stuff in the next week, and uh, we'll see you soon.